Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. Facebook is well on its way to becoming the world's largest cemetery. A recent research article out of Oxford estimates that 1.4 to 4.9 billion Facebook users will die by the year 2100, depending on the platform's growth rate. These dead users will leave behind digital remains, photos, messages, comments, etc. It's a similar story with other social media networks and websites. Think about all your Gmails, Gchats, and Google Docs. Now, all of this extremely personal data can help loved ones through the grieving process, and it could aid future generations in understanding what life was like in the 21st century. Conversely, it could reveal embarrassing, perhaps even reputation-destroying, information about the dead and be used to manipulate their next of kin. In short, this data is valuable, yet most of us treat the digital afterlife as an afterthought. And because of that, Silicon Valley firms like Facebook and Google, who serve their shareholders and not necessarily the public good, are largely in control of our digital remains and could potentially seek to monetize it. So, what's the best way to prepare our digital legacies? The digital you may very well outlive the flesh and bone you, and that might actually be a comfort to your loved ones. Jed Brubaker, an assistant professor in information science at the University of Colorado Boulder, who has worked with Facebook on issues surrounding death, told me social media has become a sort of techno-spiritual domain where survivors routinely engage in the type of reflection and speech you might associate with vigils and religious ceremonies. On social media, you can read messages saying things like, you must have the most amazing view from up there. Because social media serves as a sort of digital memorial for the deceased, Brubaker told me that deleting a dead person's profile can feel like a second death. On the other hand, many people find it disturbing when they get a notification that reminds them of a tragedy. A few years ago, for instance, the death of a user's six-year-old daughter was featured prominently in his year in review video, alongside cutesy clip art characters and tone-deaf captions. In addition, Facebook users told Brubaker that it is weird, odd, and gross to find death-related notifications amid more casual content. In a recent blog post authored by Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg, the social media giant announced that it was working on, quote, AI to keep the profile of a deceased loved one from appearing in painful ways. These changes will theoretically put an end to birthday reminders about the dead. Now, this isn't the first time Facebook has grappled with digital remains. In 2007, the platform introduced memorial pages. When a user dies, Facebook essentially freezes their account. People can still post messages on the dead person's wall, but a memorial page cannot accept new friend requests or post new content, unless the deceased person designated a legacy contact. The legacy contact can do things like change the deceased user's profile photo and download a copy of what they shared on Facebook, although they can't read messages or even see the dead person's poke history. Facebook also allows users to set up the deletion of their account in the event of their death. A Facebook spokesperson told me, quote, we have a deep respect for our unique position in people's lives and continually update our tools to help people cope when a loved one has passed away. Our priority is to provide communities with the best possible tools to honor loved ones and support each other while preserving the digital legacy of the deceased for generations to come. Now, most of the experts I spoke to commended Facebook for taking these steps. Brubaker told me the platform has the ability to help deal with these important issues, so therefore it has the obligation to. However, Evan Carroll, a researcher and co-author of the book Your Digital Afterlife, told that humans are by and large really bad at estate planning, and he suspects that not many people take advantage of Facebook's legacy contact tool or Google's inactive account manager. Carroll added that in the absence of specific instructions via a will or the platform's planning tools, the U.S. law that governs digital assets in 40-plus states, an act dubbed RUFADA, gives the platform a ton of control over our digital remains. Elaine Casket, a psychologist and author of All the Ghosts in the Machine, told me it's inappropriate that big tech is setting policies and norms about our hyper-personal data because they are driven by the profit motive. Consider Carl Ullman, a doctoral candidate at the Oxford Internet Institute, told me that maintaining and storing all that data from the billions of dead users expected to be on the platform by 2100 is going to be a considerable expense for Facebook. So the question becomes, 
How will Facebook justify that expense to shareholders? Omen worries that Facebook might someday decide to delete all of our digital remains to save money, or they might even try to commercialize it to generate revenue. Maybe that means charging you to access a memorial site, or more speculatively, a tech firm can feed someone's digital remains into a machine learning algorithm, create a chatbot that communicates like that dead person, and then use that chatbot to present marketing messages from the grave. Imagine getting a text message that sounds eerily like your dead mom. Hey, honey, it would be nice if you bought me flowers on my birthday. Bring them to my tombstone. Recreation services like chatbots sound like a Black Mirror episode, but a 2D image of Tupac did perform at Coachella in 2012, and one company offered a service that would keep you active on Twitter after your death. Their tagline was, when your heart stops beating, you'll keep tweeting. The company is now defunct, but still. A Facebook spokesperson told me that ad targeting and all ad products are shut down on memorialized profiles, but the spokesperson did not address my question on whether the platform might monetize memorial accounts in the future. In addition, Casket told me that many people are hesitant to sever a digital relationship with their deceased loved one, so they're sort of stuck in the Facebook ecosystem in order to maintain access. That's ultimately good for the social media company's bottom line. But bottom line thinking conflicts with other motivations. Omen and his colleague David Watson wrote in a research article, quote, if data are preserved solely on the basis of corporate profitability, we warn that non-economic considerations, the ethical, religious, scientific, and historical value of digital remains may be neglected. That last part, the historical value part, is particularly troubling. If Silicon Valley firms are in control of all this data about how we live, that's a ton of power in the hands of just a few companies. Alluding to George Orwell's 1984, the Oxford researchers write, quote, those who control our access to the past also control how we perceive the present. To untangle this immense power from the profit motive and take control of our digital remains from tech firms, Omen thinks there should be a decentralized public entity that maintains all this information, something similar to the Library of Congress. This data is simply too important to be overseen by private firms who don't have the obligation to serve the public good. Now, taking a step back for a minute, the idea that our tweets, Instagrams, and Facebook statuses will be studied centuries from now to try and understand life in the 21st century is a bit disturbing. In addition, Carol told me the big fear is that our loved ones see something in our digital remains that makes them question who we really are, what we really thought of them. The problem is exacerbated because the dead aren't around to defend themselves or provide context. And from a moral standpoint, just because someone is dead doesn't mean their privacy should go away. Furthermore, Connor Graham, research fellow and director of Tembusu College at the National University of Singapore, told me that social media platforms have not been constructed with posthumous identity in mind. They are all about the moment and the ephemeral. This juxtaposes with the skillful, deliberate way many of us prepare our legacies by writing careful letters to our survivors and composing a thoughtful will. Or think about historical figures. Many of the founding fathers, for instance, wrote letters and diaries with future historians in mind, not so much when I mouth off on Twitter. Whether documents created with posterity in mind are more accurate or more useful than a deluge of off-the-cuff comments, quips, and snapshots is a big question mark. Historians will inevitably contemplate that when they study President Trump's tweets or Beto O'Rourke's Instagram. But the broader point is, we all ought to come to terms with the idea that our social media posts are creating a revealing public record. Things posted in the moment can last forever. They can offend our ancestors. They can ruin our reputation, especially since we live in a gotcha culture that's always on the hunt for any little mistake we've ever made. Although, Grant Bulmer, an assistant professor of digital media at North Carolina State University, told me it's misleading to say digital assets are permanent. Software updates, hardware changes, file format changes, human error, all this imperils our data. MySpace, for instance, admitted losing 12 years of music uploads on its site earlier this year. Omen added that in the future, Facebook might conceivably go out of business. And then what happens to all this hyper-personal information? Does it get deleted or sold to the highest bidder? In short, your data, this stuff that will inform your legacy, is probably much more vulnerable than you realize. That's why Casket thinks we should all go old school and turn our valuable digital assets into physical assets. 
print out meaningful emails and messages, burn favorite CDs, have photographs developed. I mean, get a fireproof safe while you're at it, but these tangible copies will allow you to retain control over the things that are important to you. The rest, the useless emails and old tweets, the stuff that might be taken out of context or reflect poorly on us or simply outdated, Casket suggests that we all channel our inner Marie Kondo and start aggressively deleting our digital junk. Because let's be honest, most of our digital lives are a complete mess. We're hoarders of old email exchanges and repetitive dog photos. We ought to clean it up before we kick the bucket and that responsibility falls to our loved ones or some giant tech firm because they'll inevitably find something you don't want them to. Okay, I'm gonna go live my life.